a mind nimble and versatile enough to catch the resemblance of things, which is the chief point, and at the same time steady enough to fix and discern their subtle differences. My brother's interest in geology, he preceded me by four years. His work showed identical sequences of fauna, trilobites and brachiopods particularly, both in eastern Canada and in western England, which was proof, to me at least, that those two parts of the world had been joined together about half a billion years ago and had subsequently separated. And that was proof of seafloor spreading and continental drift, which at that time was definitely not accepted as a scientific theory. So that's what interested me and led me into undergraduate work at Western. Uh, the ideas about the origin of vulcanogenic massive sulfide deposits at that time was that they were all epigenetic replacement deposits, that they had been formed after the rocks had formed. And I certainly uh, came to uh, believe that that theory was incorrect. And the reason I did was because I first worked at the Normattle mine, which is a VMS deposit in northern Quebec, and saw the ores there. And then about a year later, I worked at the Buckins mine for the summer in Newfoundland. And it too was another VMS deposit. And subsequently, I worked in Cyprus and saw the Cypriot deposits, which are much younger in age. The ones at Normetal were Archean. And the ones in Newfoundland were Silurian or Devonian. And the ones in Japan are actually forming now. Gee, that ore fluid, it had to know where these rocks were through geologic time. And that's what convinced me to study massive sulfides. The ones in Cyprus were particularly interesting because they're Mesozoic in age. And uh, there were many of them. Some of them were mined by the Romans. My interest in the rare element pegmatites came because uh, in the summer of 1952, I mapped a large area that had produced some uh, niobium uh, tantalum minerals. And we mapped that area, and I did my PhD on that under my professor, Gene Cameron, at the University of Wisconsin. Oh, the iron formations are fascinating uh, iron deposits. And uh, I became interested in them when I mapped uh, Archean and subsequently younger Proterozoic iron formations. And that interest remains today. Uh, the Archean ones are always magnetite rich and contain minor amounts of gold, very minor. Whereas the younger Proterozoic ones are always hematite rich. Uh, gold deposits are of course fascinating. 
and they occur virtually in all ages of rock. The world's largest gold-producing district was the Witwatersrand in South Africa. And there the ores are called paleoplasters because they occur in ancient conglomeratic rocks uh, that occur elsewhere in the world as well. Sadly, the Witwatersrand ores are nearing exhaustion. They've led the world for over a hundred years as the world's largest. Our uranium ores at Elliott Lake Blind River in northern Ontario are also paleoplasters, but unfortunately, compared to South Africa, uh, Ours are insignificant gold producers, although they are extremely important uranium producers. My first employer, American Metal Company, uh, had a potash mine in New Mexico. And about that time, which would have been the early 1950s, potash had also been discovered in Saskatchewan. And uh, one mine was already in production. So because of their interest in potash in New Mexico, my company asked me to learn about potash deposits and how to explore for them here in Saskatchewan. And Saskatchewan is today by far the world's largest producer of potash. So I went there and drilled one deep hole about 3,500 feet deep and had the good luck to find a fascinating uh, potash deposit. That's the mineral sylvite, uh, potassium chloride. And it was at a depth of about 3,000 feet. So my company immediately said, let's drill another hole. So back I went to Saskatchewan and moved, I think it was about a mile from the little town of Bredenbury, Saskatchewan, and drilled another hole. And I was amazed to find no potash. What had happened? Well, the whole potash interval had been dissolved by groundwater, which had moved down into the soluble sylvite ore and simply dissolved the whole darn thing. I had one more fascinating experience with potash deposits. Uh, the company I was with sent me and a group of engineers to uh, what was then uh, Ethiopia. And there, there are very young potash deposits. I ran a um, potassium argon age date on them and got 102,000 years. And those ones are spectacular because they're in a total desert and the salt above the potash has, is exposed at surface. IOCG deposits uh, were remained unrecognized for a hundred years of economic geology work and were finally only recognized because of a major discovery in southern Australia. And that deposit had the three types of ore that are always present in IOCG deposits, namely uh, iron ore, copper, and gold which is what IOCG stands for. I 
couldn't agree more with you about uh, field trips as a very important way for students to learn about all these types of ore deposits, where they're located around the world, and how very important to our modern industry these deposits are, because industry simply could not operate without all of those metals and non-metals that ore deposits produce around the world. We have taken our students to as many of the world's important mining districts and visited the mines and seen all the ore deposits possible with our students so that they could see these ores in place and talk with the local geologists who told them how they were discovered, how they are mined, and the students have benefited immensely. So students are a joy and a pleasure. Today, I am very proud of them because many of them, most of them in fact, are at senior positions with the world's mining companies. One thing I have enjoyed perhaps even more than all the rocks and mineral deposits I've seen are my own graduate students.